Hey everyone, and welcome back to the Cross Border Interview Podcast. Today is our season two finale. That's right, 58 great episodes, and today is our end. Today we sit down with a great guest, but before we do, I want to just give a clarification. You're going to notice an audio change between the first 10 minutes and the last 20 minutes. We had some audio technical difficulties, so we had to stop the interview midway through and restart. So I do apologize about that. So without further ado, let's get on to the show and this is the cross-border interview podcast featuring Jackie Fensky. Welcome back to the cross-border interview podcast. Today is our season finale and our guest today is the interim leader of the Alberta party, Jackie Fensky. Jackie, thank you so much for doing this. Greatly appreciate it. Oh, my pleasure to be here, you bet. Um, usually I start off all my interviews the same way. Uh, yours is going to be a little bit different, but I'm going to still start with the same question. Where does your sense of duty come from? Oh, um, I don't. Well, I guess it goes back to parents, um, I would say, feeling that you can't just uh, do things for yourself. You have to be, uh, contribute to the community. For my parents, that was mainly through the church. And uh, I would say it was just expected that and being the eldest of five, uh, five kids, five siblings, uh, there was always a sense of duty. (laughs) It was called chores. (laughs) Well, on that note, uh, duty comes in all different sizes, nonprofit, through business, through giving back to your community and politics. You chose the political route running for city council or town council and then as an MLA and now you in your current role as the interim leader. Uh, were you the oddball in your family when it came to politics or did politics run in your family? Definitely the oddball, still the oddball, I would say. Um, yeah, I don't. My brothers and sisters took no interest except um, through what I was doing and um, we were too busy. We we came from a farming background. Uh, part of it was we had a dairy with a you know the quota kept you busy. You had no um, no opportunity. And then we moved into town, and uh, you know it was just uh, it was constantly just surviving and enjoying your family, right? Um. In uh, 2020, uh, I don't think I need to tell you because you were there and you chose to take on the role. You took on the role as interim leader of the Alberta Party. You are coming up to your end of your tenure as the interim leader. In October, they're going to be selecting a new leader. Uh, The leadership race is on for the Alberta Party. How has your time been as the leader of the Alberta Party, the interim leader? Well, Chris, uh, um, I mean, I know you, you know me a little from of uh, from when I was in MLA, and uh, my love has always been to get out in the community and get out and meet people. Uh, that's what makes me tick. That's what I've uh, that's how I've always run, whether it's municipal or provincial, is is to be there and available. Uh, so COVID, of course, didn't let us do that, though that was our original plan, and that was a little frustrating to adapt to that. Um, my tenure originally was going to be probably till the end of the summer in 2020. And that's when we were supposed to have our AGM and then the start and our leadership race. But again, um, actually our AGM was supposed to be in the spring, so it got delayed. So that sort of put everything back. And, uh, so here I am a year past my due date and, um, uh, well, I've, I've enjoyed working with the people, and I have to tell you that uh, I have never, I mean, I've been involved in a lot of groups and organizations, but I have been challenged uh, by the members of the Alberta Party. I have loved that challenge, and I have also loved their response to, you know, I mean, when, when things are challenging and you go back and forth, it's not an immediate, oh, yeah, that's what, that's that's acceptable. Uh, there's questioning, there's uh, looking at it from all different directions before a decision is made. And we don't always agree then on the answers, but we've had, uh, for the most part, a thorough discussion and um, 
uh, and uh, trying to find an understanding from from all points of view, which is what the Alberta Party is about. It's it's pragmatic, right? It's not trying to center. It's not trying to say uh, I'm uh, I'm left, I'm right, I fit on the polit- political spectrum. It's trying to say, okay, here are the issues. Uh, here's the future, or what we want to have for the future for Alberta. How do we uh, how do we get there, and how do we take care of the people who are currently uh, Albertans? Well, and you, you Sorry, bring up long, you. Long answer. No, hey, it's good. If you didn't talk, it would be a really bad interview. Um, <laughs> you, you bring up a good point, though, because we are in a more divided time than we have ever been in Alberta's history. Uh, you are seeing more and more people gavinate towards the left and the right. And the few people who are left in the middle are feeling politically homeless. Why do you believe that the Alberta party is the best party to represent the true, and I I say the middle of the road because they are not divided one way or the other, but why do you believe the Alberta party is the right party for the future of Alberta? Well, because just as you said, we're not divided uh, down the middle of the road. Someone will say, oh, you're the mushy center, I think is a term people use. We don't always pick the answer in the center. If you look at what our policies are or where we find solutions, sometimes it will come from an extreme left uh, point of view on the political spectrum. And sometimes it will come from the far right. But when you take all of those and you sort of balance, do the average, that's when you can say, oh, okay, that's, you tend to even out on both sides because you're looking after uh, all Albertans because not all Albertans are the same and some come from uh, very urban backgrounds, some come from very rural, some come, you know, just because of their cultural history, they uh, they have different uh, viewpoints. And so when you average out those decisions, it's oh, okay, it's sort of in the center, zero or, you know, it's not left or it's not right. But that doesn't mean that the solutions are always in the center. Uh, I like to say, um, as I said before, we're pragmatic. Uh, we we understand the value of the dollar and that we have to be responsible with taxpayers, Albertans dollars, not only paying the bills today, but investing in the future. Uh, so when, um, when it was time to... Um, uh, when the current premier was looking for support and I was a, a PC MLA at the time, we had a meeting in the, you know, the darkness of the room of the McDonald's hotel. <laughs> it was very, very beautiful. Uh, and uh, he went on about how, what his, what his position was going to be and what his platform was, which we all know is about uh, paying down the debt. And we know that uh, that's not going so well right now, even pre pandemic, uh, he was not on the right path, but um, so at the end, he, you know, do you have any other questions? And uh, at the time, uh, and uh, so my question to him was, well, that's great, Premier. So what about the social programs? Well, he wasn't the Premier at the time. What about the social programs? And his response was, well, we will have the best social programs when we pay down the debt. And even then, uh, my, uh, you know, comment to him was, well, there are people who can't wait, like, you know, seniors. What if my mom needs help now? Uh, she's not going to be around when we pay down that debt. And now that that target date has gotten further and further down the road. So um, I'm not, uh, you know, that that wasn't is where I was headed. And we were talking about people being politically homeless and so I needed my party left me and I needed to find a new party just as you had said that many Albertans uh, are looking uh, for a party that that better reflects their position in life where they are in life and I I truly believe that the Alberta party is that party it's not extreme I mean sometimes we do have to make a a decision that someone would might label extreme or not quite fit with uh, where they are. Uh, but when you when you look at the overall population of Alberta, the four and a half million people, uh, you try to find the right answer that allows people to live with dignity and that allows us to position for the future. And that's the Alberta party. So you have spent uh, 
the better part of a year and almost a year and a half uh, uh, since you've been named interim leader, uh, talking to Albertans, talking to not just only party membership, I'm assuming, but to mem- to Albertans who are not uh, party members who might want to join. What are you hearing from Albertans? Because you have been the interim leader during a unprecedented time. COVID-19 <laughs> is not something anyone had on their 2020 bingo card or 2021 bingo card. So what are you hearing from them? Are they concerned about the future with way Jason Kenney's going? Or are they concerned about other things that most people, uh, like Jason Kenney's not talking about, Rachel Notley's not talking about? Well, when you look at the recent polls, uh, you'll find that I believe the numbers 27% are saying, I don't agree with, I don't want to vote for, and I don't agree with the UCP, and I don't want, uh, or nor do I agree with the ND. So, yes, Albertans are trying to find uh, a new space, someone to represent them. But let's remember, we're all, we have all gone through months and months of uh, the pandemic, having to adjust, change on a regular basis, dependent on, you know, what the current a uh, decision was made as to how to deal deal with the pandemic and keeping us safe. We're tired. I'm not sure we're quite ready to want to roll up our sleeves and get back into, you know, the nitty gritty of politics. That being said, the time is coming soon when we will have to. We'll be faced with a, a federal election soon. Uh, municipal, of course, is this year. And uh, and then we're on. We're already into campaign season for the next provincial election. So we we will have to become engaged. And we will have to talk about the things that that really affect our lives and that are important to us. And uh, and we're seeing we're seeing right now that there's a good quarter of the population that doesn't like the options. And the other thing, Chris, about that is if you look at the polls over the last um, last while, you'll find that it is trending in that more and more people are disillusioned with the two options uh, that we talked about. They are looking for an alternative. So not only is there a huge chunk of of society, uh, Albertan society that is looking, uh, that is growing and that's saying something, even if you don't go talk to the people. But yes, we have been out talking to the people. We've been uh, listening to creating, putting together expert panels so that we can talk about the issues. Uh, I work with a shadow cabinet, a group of people who are passionate about uh, positioning Alberta for the future and also taking care of the business of today. And as I said, um, what's great about this this group and, and the board and, and those who choose to identify with the Alberta party is we're just not going to take it because somebody said so. We challenge each other. And, and that's great. We are, um, like I said, a year into this pandemic. If the Alberta party was the government of the day, how would you have done better? How would you have made sure that Albertans aren't being left behind? Because I hear stories from Albertans from across this province, uh, from the north where I was originally from to here in Calgary, where I'm stationed now, that they are feeling that it is tougher to get a house, to find a job. How would the Alberta party have helped the people of Alberta during this time? Was there a policy that you, you said, Jason Kenney needs to implement this policy to ensure that people aren't being left behind. Well, we have put some forward uh, and I just off the top of my head, you know, you're going to be quizzed here of some of them. Uh, I, I'll have to think for a moment, but even the UCP have adopted some of our ideas and we've applauded when they have, we've pushed uh, ideas towards them when they haven't. If we're talking about the entire pandemic, I think we started to make our mistakes at the beginning. Uh, We needed to be transparent. People needed to know some of what uh, the premier and uh, his cabinet, some of that information needed to come out to the people. So there was a better understanding of what we were dealing with. And granted, things changed all along. But I think if you're open with people and and you present them with the facts, they are more... um, sympathetic to what has to be done and uh, more more willing. I mean, you can't hide things and you can't be making things up. I mean, we've, we've come across some times where, <laughs> uh, you know, that, that I, I don't want to say that, I want to say that they were very casual with the truth at some point. Well, the reason I asked that question is because, um, and it, the only reason I'm asking the next question is because it's a topic that is on everyone's mind right now. The 
two sets of rules during this pandemic that the UCP have uh, decided to ensure upon enshrined upon themselves. One being Hawaii gate or Aloha gate or however you want to say it. Uh, we found a UCP members leaving the province during a pandemic when international flights was not recommended. And just recently, as this is going to be going out at the end of the month, and this is at the beginning of the month, um, we see the premier, the health minister, the finance minister, uh, and the environment minister, government house leader, all sitting around at a patio uh, in the Sky Palace, eating, drinking, yes. and not following the guidelines put in place by the chief medical officer. Uh, first off, as the interim, as the leader of the Alberta Party, what are your thoughts on what has transpired in the politics in the last 24 hours <laughs> around this? Well, certainly I uh, posted that lovely picture on my social media. Uh, <laughs> and I mean, it's not just one picture and of course I'm getting all kinds of responses but oh there are more important things to deal with and and other responses which are uh, probably not like it's all ends of the spectrum but these are the leaders of our province leaders need to set the example they need to not just uh, do as I say but they actually need to be following the rules so I just I thanks for this in because um you know, it's I don't I don't think any of them are going to get COVID from their particular little uh, patio party, but um, they uh, they're the ones who create the rules. So over a year and a half ago, Jason Kenney took away the power from the chief medical officer of health, and uh, that now rests with him and his cabinet. Uh, that individual, in this case, Dr. Henshaw, no longer has the last say. So all of the rules and the decisions have to be approved or have, you know, I mean, they're not going to go out unless uh, the premier says that that's acceptable. And um, some of the rules or the, you know, are, are just, oh, I've got to say, you could, there's so many holes in them, you could drive a semi through, like, it, they don't make sense. People will embrace the rules, they will do what's right if it makes sense. But uh, earlier in this whole pandemic, let's you were single and you could have two people in your bubble. So if your parents were separated, didn't live in the same home, they could be part of your bubble. But if they were married, well, you couldn't go see them for months, right? Like it just doesn't make sense. And you need to have realistic regulations. So that's one thing. They're the ones in charge of them. Um, if they don't like them, then they should change them. And they have the ability to change them. Otherwise, for Follow the rules. Uh, the other is that leaders need to lead by example. And uh, they they weren't. I mean, they could say if they were in a restaurant, let's imagine, let's say that the patio was a restaurant. Well, they had more than, what is the current, I think, four people at the table and certainly more than two different households represented there. Uh, yep. If that was a meeting in the sky, the, an outdoor meeting, then it didn't follow those regulations because there could be no in and out, indoors and out, you know, going in and out. And in some of the photos, not the one that I posted, but others that were um, part of this whole series, they have wait staff going in and out. They have people going in and out. And um, some of the, most of those people are not masked. So if you're in that type of situation, then you're supposed to be socially distanced and masked. So there is no you know, pick or choose which you are, but you didn't follow the rules in any of them. And so why are you expecting Albertans to follow rules? And I want to say that as the Alberta party, we took a stand the week prior when uh, Premier Kenny came out and said, these are the benchmarks. This is when things are going to happen. And we took some heat for saying, yes, we agree. It's time to open. Uh, we're happy to ha know what those benchmarks are. It, we believe that the vaccine, we have, accept the fact that we need to use the vaccine uh, to get us out of that pandemic. That's been the accepted uh, method, not only in Alberta, but um, uh, through the nation and, and across the world. So we need to get be better at getting to the people who need those first shots. And then, frankly, if there was... Um, we, we need the second shots. And so thankfully, the premier announced that this week as well, because there were, uh, it, it was appalling to hear that people would um, book an appointment, purposely book an appointment and purposely not show up so that that uh, 
the, that drug would go to waste. And it's, it's then you know we need to be opening up to the second vaccine because we yeah. can't be wasting um, this precious lifeline. No, and I agree. Anyway. Um, the the other more uh, more pressing issue, and I and I say that with all respect because uh, it is a sensitive topic. Um, earlier this month, actually, literally this last weekend, um, the remains of 215 Aboriginal mm-hmm. students were found in a near a Ken Loops residential school. Uh, uh, I just want to take this moment and get your thoughts on it and just how, how we as Albertans, but also Canadians can do better when it comes to addressing First Nations Indigenous issues as well. Yes. So as a mother, I can't imagine someone ripping my child from my arms, from my house and taking them away. Could you imagine what you would do to fight to get that child back and to never hear from them again and not know what was happening? Uh, and and now perhaps to to lose all hope to to think that they actually had passed away, um, it's just devastating. It's heartbreaking, and um, it makes me sick that we do that. And we need to we need to hear the truth before we we can continue on with reconciliation. We've heard that over and over again. We need to have that understanding. And uh, you know the Alberta Party. I I know it sounds going back to that but we have said that we needed to to identify that we needed to take the time spend the money to do that and we're glad that uh, that the UCP government has chosen to invest in finding out uh, I believe they made that announcement yesterday uh, doing some investing to find out uh, where where the remains of these uh, wonderful children are and uh, how we can um, honor them and honor honor their life and um, and acknowledge their passing in a way that is um, that has scarred our nation right and it, they, it I just, certainly has yeah so we we can do better and we will do better I mean and this week we also met uh, with um, members of the Jewish community and I'm, I'm again appalled that in 2021 young students uh, of Jewish uh, of the, in the Jewish culture, Jewish um, heritage, heritage. Thank you. Um, are afraid to go to school because they are being bullied and attacked. No one, no one should live in fear uh, in Canada, in Alberta, in 2021, to be able to be uh, an active part of the community. It, we, I, it, it, it just takes a few people to um, make life unbearable and unacceptable. And we need to call out those people and we need to make changes. Um, One last uh, area that I want to touch on before we do turn to the leadership race is energy, 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 energy. Uh, Calgary Mm -hmm. has been hit with two pandemics. Uh, I use that word lightly when talking about the second one, but the first one being the global pandemic of uh, COVID-19. The first, the second one being the economic downturn of oil prices. Um, I'm assuming because you're an Alberta party uh, leader, you are and former MLA for the progressive conservatives, you are in uh, favor of the energy industry. How can we work with our partners to ensure that the energy industry is uh, robust moving forward, but also start transitioning as every politician besides uh, Jason Kenney seems to be talking about, uh, away from the fossil fuels and into green energy and renewable energy? Well, Chris, uh, when I was on municipal council, I represented the area that uh, has Alberta's industrial heartland as a component of it. So I'm very familiar of looking at ways of diversifying. We're, we're not going to get rid of oil and gas. Yep. We will continue to have a strong oil and gas industry, but it's not going to grow as we, you know, wished upon for uh, for forever or thought that we would so we need to and we also need to be re uh, support uh, methods that are going to ensure that our our world is here for for my children my grandchildren and my great-grandchildren so we have to take care of the environment and um, the Alberta party has been talking about hydrogen since I became um, probably three weeks after I became the acting leader and we've continued to do that uh, it was great to see that the UCP finally put some dollars in, and I believe it was last December, 
the NDs finally recognized that, oh yeah, hydrogen might be a good idea. Uh, we believe that there's other investments that could be made. You know, We'd like to almost be known as the party of trains. We're not talking high speed rail. We're talking other opportunities that, uh, that Amtrak has gone, uh, has explored in the United States, but being able to move people uh, from community to community. Uh, we've got lines, we've got sidings that are available. Um, uh, so why shouldn't someone who lives in Wetaskiwin not be able to hop that train and go to university? Um, and don't let's not go on to post-secondary. That's another whole topic. <laughs> but why shouldn't they be able to live at home and attend the University of Alberta by hopping on a train? Uh, so there are just so many things that we can do to um, adjust what's happening in our province and to position it for the future. In the meantime, in between time, we need to start retraining our workers who are in oil and gas. And there's a huge opportunity because there are so many um, similarities. It's not going to take like starting from scratch one. It's just uh, from square one. You're, you're just going to have to readjust and learn a few additional skills. And we should be, we can be uh, the world's experts at that if we would just start doing it and stop saying that our answer is only totally oil and gas. Uh, and we're talking about health. Uh, Alberta's got the great population to be able to, um, and a central um, system that there are so many things we can do with in the realm of health care and, um, and be sort of the, the leaders there. And of course, tech, everyone knows that you're in Calgary and a growing tech industry that needs to continue to have our support. And, um, and, and I always say, we need to have a policy on first adoption. We put this money into yeah. R&D and then we don't have um, a government that has, uh, I, I mean, the next step is what I'm hearing is that these people who have uh, done the research and developed the products, they need someone to adopt it, to take it. And if, if we found that way in our province, they would find an easier path even globally to have acceptance of uh, whatever product or system that they've created. Well, one of the big things that's coming out of uh, the United States right now, and our premier has been taking a, uh, taking this issue up with the governor of Michigan, is line five. Um, this is a necessity, according to Jason Kenney, to get our oil to uh, market. Uh, what is your opinion on line five? And do you believe that it still needs to be open? And the, are you calling on the governor of Michigan to keep it open and not close it down as she's been wanting to do for the last, I think, two, three months by executive order? Yeah, I, I believe we need line five. I mean, there has to be, but we not only need line five, we need to get back to the table and talk about uh, the, our own national system. I mean, that. um, what do, was it called the Northern Line? I mean, Northern there are other Gateway. ways that we need to. Yeah, we need. We, there are other ways that we need to be moving our uh, our product. We cannot be totally reliant on the United States. Uh, and uh, so I don't know. I, I you know I hear pros and cons about going out to the Hudson through the Hudson's Bay. Uh, we've talked with the governor of Alaska prior to the the last election about moving moving oil and gas through Alaska. They've got a different mindset than the government in of Michigan. So what else are we doing to look at alternatives? We are landlocked. We rely on, and so let's go to that. We rely on our federal government to be able to be there with them, and we need to work with them for, for Alberta's sake and for Canada's sake. And we can't constantly be uh, have a premier who... Uh, chooses not to uh, utilize federal programs, who chooses to have an adversarial uh, approach, constant adversarial approach with our federal uh, partners. We're here for all of Albertans. And sometimes we've got to, you know, pull up, pull up our bootstraps and, and, work Bite our lip work. and get to work <laughs> exactly um let's let's jump into the big thing that is going on right now with the alberta party uh like i said at the beginning of the interview your time as interim leader is coming to an end here uh the election for the next permanent leader of the alberta party is november 6th um 
nominations are now open. What are you hearing from candidates or potential candidates or from people looking at the Alberta party to say, well, we're not sure if we're going to start going with uh, the Alberta party until they have an, uh, a permanent leader. What are you hearing? How is the party leadership uh, election going so far? I know we are just in its early days, but nominations close at the end of August. So how is it going? Well, uh, you're right. People are sort of sitting back waiting uh, to do their donations, to do their volunteering until the, the leader is there. And we're trying to be uh, cognizant, too, of not uh, creating so many policies that that they sort of corner of the new leader. We, we want to have our policy AGM after the new leader is uh, is elected. So this is what I can tell you. We will be the only party in Alberta the provincial party in Alberta that will be having a leadership race is going to be exciting. And um, ah, we will have a choice, unlike the NDs, unlike the UCP, unlike uh, the Wild Rose Independent Party, we will have a choice. So if there is a candidate that you like, you have an opportunity to make that difference by getting, getting out there and supporting them. Now, saying that, I don't think any of the people that I've talked to strategy sounds like anything before the end of June, early July, and then uh, we will probably start to hear some announcements. How can people get involved? Because I know to to vote in the leadership race, you, I'm assuming you have to be a member. So how can people get involved and vote for the next leader of the Alberta party if they choose to take out a membership? So yes, they do need to purchase their membership. Uh, um, and, uh, sorry, uh, they, um, they need to purchase their membership. They need to, uh, get behind a candidate, do some volunteering for them, help them sell memberships. Because remember, this is an internal process. It's not quite like, uh, an election, a general election. And, um, they can do that by going online to albertaparty.ca or if, when they hear of a candidate that they'd like to support. They should reach out to them and uh, work with them. And if there's a candidate that uh, you think should be running, sometimes all they need is just one more ask to be able to put their name forward. So get out there and encourage them and say that you will be there to help them through the process. Uh, you might not know this off the top of your head, but I'm going to ask it anyway. Is it a one number, one vote uh, leadership race or is it a constituent run uh, leadership race? How does the internal politics work? Do you know that off the top of your head? It's one member, one vote, and it's a preferential ballot. Preferential ballot. Okay, perfect. Um, my last question for you before we wrap up here, Jackie, is what advice would you give the next leader of the party? I would tell that leader to sit, take, take a few, take a little time, sit back and get out and listen. And then, um, and, and remember, uh, remember the groups, the organizations that need some extra support and reach out to them uh, and um, do what we've done. Review the Lougheed Conservative principles because they're very similar to the Alberta Party principles. And just the verbiage might be slightly different because that's us. And uh, unlike our current le leader, uh, walk the talk. What do you mean by that, walk the talk? Well, don't say something and do the opposite, I guess. <laughs> So I'm assuming you mean the premier in that case, not yourself, right? Because you said yes, the leader. Yes. Okay. Oh, yeah, Just that's right. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, wow. That's I really stepped into that one, didn't I? Yes. So, um, yeah, get out and listen. I mean, and they will have the opportunity to be there in person. And, yeah, I'm, I'm trying to walk the talk, but, hey, I'm not perfect either. <laughs> Perfect. Well, Jackie, I want to thank you so much for doing this. Uh, for my listeners, uh, the in the show notes, there will be a link to the Alberta Party website uh, and their leadership uh, 2021 website, but also to the Alberta Party social media pages. Please go and follow them, follow along, be, participate. Elections can only happen with people like you. Jackie, I want to thank you once again for doing this, sitting down and taking time out of your busy schedule to do this. Greatly appreciate it. Oh, Chris, thank you very much. And I look forward to seeing you face to face again and not just... Uh through the the uh, through the ability of um, our telecommunications system. <laughs>
I want to thank Jackie for sitting down and doing that with us today. Greatly appreciate it. But I also want to take this moment and thank you, the listeners. This is our last scheduled interview and our last scheduled episode until Monday, August 2nd. We may be releasing some episodes over the next few weeks, depending on breaking news as it comes out. Season three will be launching on Monday, August 2nd. That's right. Monday, August 2nd. Circle it in your calendar. We will be back with a great interview as our season premiere. Former MLA Darren. Eric Fox will be sitting down with us. So I really hope you do tune in because he gives us an in-depth look of politics in Alberta in the 1980s and the early 1990s. I really hope if you're a political follower, hit the subscribe button because you do not want to miss that interview. If you haven't already, please hit that subscribe button. Follow us on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook, and also YouTube. Once again, thank you so much for tuning in over the last 10 months. Greatly appreciate it. Have yourself an excellent rest of the summer. The Cross Border Interview Podcast was produced, edited, and sponsored by Miranda Brown and Associates Incorporated. Incorporated.